All right, welcome to episode 89 of Random Thoughts. Today, we're gonna to talk really about how hard you should work to get maximal adaptation and how you can measure that. Yeah, measuring quantification of how hard you should train, how you can know what hard training is versus going too soft, how to know the limits, mm. and also how to know to sort of trick your central governor and your internal wuss, if you will, that yeah. wants to constantly be telling you to do less yeah. and how you can know how to manage him better. Mm. Or her. Oh, exactly. Um, all right, so let's talk. So let's establish some basic parameters, and then we'll go a little bit deep. Yep. So the basic thing is, if you don't train at all, uh, you will be unfit and unable to do anything. You just sit on a couch, waste away. Yeah, like you, you don't go anywhere. Uh, if you train too hard, you will. And then if you try, if you try to go from a state of not training enough to playing sport, uh, you'll break. Um, that's the whole point of training is to build up a tolerance to the sport so that when it comes sport yeah. day you can perform yeah. above what you trained at hopefully sport day like sport that. day <laughs> competition day <laughs> race day match day whatever you want to call it oh, God. just I not think, sport day I know I think we should stick with sport day <laughs> you get up in the morning how are you taking oh I'm good it's sport day I haven't played competitive sport in a while <laughs> I'm so used to, I'm so used to we, we spend so much time in here training and I think you, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that the athletes have to compete yeah. and this so, is just a means to an end. This is just a way of making them better on sport day. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have sport day? You, it's, Monday is your sport Monday's day. Monday is my, my very casual Monday night yeah. basketball sport day. So, so the one end you've got um, not doing enough and pretty much guaranteeing um, that you're going to have an injury if you try and do intense stuff off the back of nothing because you've got no base. Uh, and at the other end you have doing way too much and either damaging yourself within the training or being so overcooked that you get injured in competition. Or that you just perform really poorly because your nervous system and your body is just constantly chronically fatigued and exhausted. And you don't know why. Yeah. yeah. So it's like that living under a constant fog or cloud mm. of exhaustion. And so the real, um, the real dance for a strength and conditioning coach, for a high-performance coach, for an athletic development coach, and for a sport coach uh, is training your athletes just the right amount. So hard enough that you get the adaptations you want, but and they're not frequently enough. As yeah. well. But not so infrequent or so easy that you're not getting adapted. That they're, wa- they're effectively wasting weight, just yeah. slower. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it's, it's an area that is exploding with all different uh, technologies um, and approaches. And stuff. Yep. Um, and it's a vital area to get right. If you, the coaches that get it right, uh, I see sport coaches who've got really good instincts for that who remind me of um, being like uh, Bart Cummings, famous horse horse trainer, who really knows how to... Like, if you just back Bart Cummings at the Melbourne Cup, you do really well. Like yeah, he's, you'd probably be ahead. He's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, one of my favourite uh, quotes from him ever is... Um, it was um, someone was asking how much he charges to train their horse, and he's like, uh, it's $20,000 a month, um, or it's 30000 if you help. <laughs> I just love that. Charge you more for your contributions. Because <laughs> like he's just, just very subtly saying, if you want me to do this, I'll do it's it. Gonna do, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it right. Because he knows people won't like it because people are going to want him to train the horses harder. Because he's famous for sparing his horses and for having them thrive off lower volumes and competing trainers. Yeah. And so we talk about the concept mm-hmm. here of uh, MED or minimal effective dose, yeah. which is not about, it's not about being a wuss and being lazy and getting away with doing less. It's about finding out for every individual and every situation, every time of the season or time of a peaking for a race, what the right amount of stimulus is for that day or that given week. Yeah. So an athlete comes in and says, I've got, I've got a 3K race on the weekend or I've got a tournament coming up and so all right, you're fit, you're ready, but you've got a tournament coming up, so we need to be wary of not making you too sore or digging too deep of a hole yeah. to keep you ready for that. So today we need to dial back this, we need to dial up that, and you, you sort of you're pulling all these levers and adjusting all these factors and all these variables in your training, not just in the training session, but in the week and mm. the fortnight as well, to get that athlete ready for competition time. And so it's not yeah, and it's not minimal dose, it's minimal effective dose. And it might be even better if you phrased it. Minimal performance dose. Mm. So you had that sense. Minimal of, effective performance dose. <laughs> it's not. It doesn't roll off the tongue as well. No. Um, and so uh, when you have smaller teams and a, a strong experiential basis, you can make a lot of those calls. When just, you say smaller teams, so if you've got a if you've got a uh, a basketball team, for instance, I think it's way easier to get your read on the players by talking to them. You've only got 
12 players. Yeah, right. Okay. So literally a smaller squad versus a football or a rugby team where yeah. you've got 18, 20, 30 guys, all yeah. girls. And then, and then particularly in the AFL uh, setting where you've got all these guys who are in the mix because, you know, in, in some sports, it's essentially the same team every week. And in other sports... And, and in sports like basketball as well where you've got minutes where the same five players start and they'll play 25 to 30 minutes each. Quite... That's the bulk of the entire game where the same five players of your 12 are on the field. And so, and because of, because everyone runs a fair bit, in, in basketball you can actually do a fair bit of your load monitoring by looking at the minutes players play mm. and talking to them about how they're feeling and, and looking at their shooting percentage because when their shooting percentage is rubbish, sometimes that can be that they're tired. Yeah. Sometimes it can just be random. You just have bad games, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but in, in footy I think the load monitoring is much more important yeah. and... Sorry, yeah, on. on that, keep going. Do you want to talk about Darren Burgess's... Because you oh, saw him present, was it 12 yeah, months ago a, now, 18 yeah, months ago? The, the load guru, he's amazing. And talk about his, the way they... Because in footy, it's harder to talk to your individual players and just watch them and read them because there's so many of them. Yeah. And so many of them in different states based on whether they're coming up from reserves or they haven't played so, in a while. or stuff So much. much stuff goes into it. So he uses a number of things. He uses um, predict a the same test that we've now adopted at the Melbourne Boomers. Uh, which is a predicted VO2 max from a sub-maximal yo-yo test. So you do the yo-yo test for four minutes. Yo-yo, which for those who don't know, is the uh, new version, the new and improved beep test effectively. So yeah. it's, it's slightly more anaerobic and it's more repeat sprints versus continuous I mean, it's running. just beep test week, but you get to rest at the end of each shuttle. Yeah, and so and it measures a different metric as yeah. well. Um, and so he uses that and, that, and that's and that measures your recovery rate. And so you can actually see... Uh, how the fitness is from week to week, but by integrating that into the warm up, it's just a thing that gets done. Right. Um, how long does it take? Uh, it's like four minutes. Right. Yeah. And that gives you a pretty good. It's got a really high correlation. He did a paper on it, of course, because you know he's the very doctor. clever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he uses that, uh, and then he uses. And so at a footy club, they would do that once a week. Yeah, like every Monday. Every so Monday they can because right. because the danger is if you start. If you if you start reading into body language too much and and hearing people complain too much, there is a danger that you can back off too many weeks in a row and actually erode the fitness that you worked so hard to build in the preseason. You let your lazy players dictate your pace, not your hard workers, because they're the squeaky wheels often. Yeah. Um. So they're going to make the noise. Uh. So he does. He so he has the predictive VO two max. Um. And also does heart rate variability. Cool. Um. And does heartbeat. We should stop the heart rate variability yeah, is um, so traditionally measured heart rate beats per minute. Yeah. Heart rate variability is correct me if I'm wrong here, it's the gap, the difference and the yeah, fluctuation so between yeah. your beats. It's it's what is measuring you've got parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, aspects to your nervous system, the ones either in dominance and so, like, the, so, so the up upside and the downside. You're either wired or you're relaxed, essentially fight or fight or flight. Um, uh, fight or flight versus rest and digest is, yep. is a nice way to put it. Uh, I didn't invent that. That's no, it's been around for a while. Um, uh, and what what you're measuring, what changes is when you are um, parasympathetic, when you are more relaxed, you're more relaxed. It changes. You have a more lively, agile heartbeat. It's you're, more reactive. Yeah. It jumps around. Whereas it's more like a metronome when you're tired. When you're tired, it's just kind of like going boom, through boom. the motions. So it's actually yeah, because your nervous system is literally less able to do it. And so they measure that, and uh, that's a really good measure of overall stress. Um, I've found, because we've both played around with each other, yeah. and it's really good early on. The first month of it was phenomenal, and then I got a little run down because of a stressful week, or mm. I had a late night or something like that. And then once I got into the, it goes red, orange, green, green yeah, to go. Traffic light system, it's really clever. Really yeah. clever. Uh, and you just do it every morning straight out of bed, mm. chuck it on, sit or lie there, and it measures for you. Um, mine was great while well, it was great, but as soon as I got down, it just stayed down. Mm. And it wouldn't come back up, and so like I, uh, I'll, I'll have a lighter session today. I'll, I'll skip this workout, and all of a sudden, because I was starting to skip workouts, I was starting to decondition. And so, yeah. just like we talked about at the start of the show mm. today, that idea of completely resting. HIV was telling me to always rest because you're was... in a danger zone. But I was in the danger zone because I wasn't training, and it was overreactive. Yeah, yeah. and so oh. I think it's getting better. That was a couple of years ago now. Oh, I tried it again recently. I was still, I was still no. Good. no. Um, I think it's a really interesting area, but I'm not. I think maybe it's it's got too much sensitivity. Yeah. Um, a good example of another thing with too much sensitivity is um, using um, the velocity based training is really useful for a whole bunch of things, but it can be problematic uh, using that as your 
as your soul loading tool as well. Where basically, if someone's not lifting as fast as normal, yeah, yep. yeah. So uh, VBT velocity based training is a is a really cool concept where you use not just the weight on the bar, but how fast they lift it, which is a, awesome as a determiner of freshness yeah. and a determiner of how whether they should go up or not, basically in weights. But it can be a little like, same I, thing. I think it can. I think it's useful to be part of your. And what Dr. Burgess really did a great job of was was had developing a suite of measures, a whole bunch of different things. And then he could see if one of them was a bit of a red herring, he could see it easily enough. Yeah. Uh, I remember chatting to Suki Hobson, who's now, who was at Geelong, then in Essendon, is now at uh, Milwaukee Bucks. The Bucks in the NBA. Um, yep. And I asked her if she would do it again. She said, yeah, probably not, because it just it too often just suggested backing off too much. And that's what I found in my training. Also, what I found... So this is HIV. Yeah, yep. also what I found with HIV was... Um, no, the vel- she was the velocity. Oh, so she wouldn't yeah. use VBT. Sorry, Sorry I'm jumping around. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. velocity based training. She Suki would not use that again. Was for that said. purpose. Yeah. yeah. Um, I found too that that the as convenient as the HRV was, um, it responded to all stress, which I think is interesting. Like it responded to like if I had a really hard day at work, my score would be significantly lower the next day, yeah. which is great. Um, and it's good to have that as one of your things, but if that's your sole guide, then... If you, you know, work hard, if you're a big-time CEO, you're yeah, never going to get any training done. Yeah, it was yeah. really interesting, yeah. Um, but I think the... the So there are all different ways you can measure the status of your athletes, and, and the best and most old-fashioned way um, is actually talking to your athletes. Well, there's one more we should talk about as well, which is RPE. Yeah. yeah. Um, I still think talking to your athletes is awesome. Uh, actually getting to know where they're at and what their signs are and harder with a big group. Um, But yeah, RPE is, I think it's probably the gold standard in terms of reliability. It's been well validated um, and it's pretty easy. Anyone can do it. Anyone who's got, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. And a paper. And a paper, you know. Um, So why don't you talk about RPE? So RPE is the concept of rate of perceived exertion. So you do exercise a set a thing and at the end of it maybe a workout an entire workout Mm. and you go how hard was that 10 being the hardest you could ever have worked one being it was a nap on the couch yeah or you know stroll around the park type thing and so you know a hard bike session might be an eight a hard intense team training where you're trying out for a squad might be a 10 and then everything sort of falls in between there and Mm. so you can also use this for individual exercises so for example Mm your heaviest sets of your squats or yep. your heaviest sets of push-ups or whatever it might be. And you go, how hard was that sprint or squat or yep. call it or it might be? And, that can, and you, can, you can score individual things mm. or an entire workout in that way. And RPE times load is where it gets pretty... It's pretty neat. And More times time as well. T- yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I've rather RPE times time to create your load score. Your yeah, train load, yeah. Yep. Uh, that's, that's a pretty neat system. So if you've done uh, 30 minutes at... Eight out of ten, you've now and your times those, you've now got two hundred and forty points. Yeah, and you can just treat it as units of work. And I think that's that's pretty clever. Yeah. Um, I would encourage um, people to use it because I think it's a great way to just get your head around where your athletes are at. Uh, but it has to be used. There's a number of things you've got to do to get to get good value out. I think the most important is get a sense of where people's natural set point is. Yeah. Because if you have twenty athletes and you have more RB. Some people will will rate a session as being an eight, and the same session someone else might rate it as being a five, um, based on what on their um, whinginess, their wussiness, their whinginess, toughness, their fitness, even to a degree. Yeah, um, whether the session suited their skill set or their mm. mindset. So, for example, you might do a hard like boot camp type session that might suit your stronger, more powerful athletes, might rate it. but your weaker ones or your smaller athletes might not enjoy that as much. And you might, and therefore may perceive it to be harder due to enjoyment yeah you might do a 3k time trial and the one that found the boot camp really hard will love the 3k yeah. time trial because it's nice and easy yeah it's a yeah. continuous then, exercise yeah. yeah um and so so i think you've got to establish like so you so the thing is you still need to get to know your athletes a, even if you don't know them personally you need to know their trends of what they're going to tend to rate yeah. things um but i think and it's very validated and you know multiple great studies have validated it and I'm not questioning its validity, but what I have found is that people tend to revert to the mean a lot. And that's even with it being being secret. Because if, if you do it, if you do it publicly, and, and I say, "Hey, Jacob, how hard was that session?" and you say that was a six, yeah. and then you go and ask James in front of me, and then hey, well, he's going to say, 
either a five or a, he's very unlikely to say it was a nine if it was a nine for him because it feels like a wuss. As soon as that first person says the number, yeah. so if you ask me first and I say six, yeah. everyone else is going to be either five, six or seven. They're going to be slightly above or slightly below. I mean, no one's going to be going nines and twos. All yeah. of a sudden, everything's just... Like and said, and that's why athlete management systems where you add it straight into your phone are, are really good. Um, where the athlete does it themselves, you mean? Yeah. yeah. So the athlete grabs their phone, end of the session, we trained for two hours, I thought it was a six out of ten. Yeah. And, and that's that a secret. Yeah. Um, or uh, the team manager very quietly going up to each player and just going like this and the player goes, that man actually touch <laughs> seven. So the others don't necessarily yeah. know. Um, so it's good. But people, but even doing all that, people tend to just get, particularly team sport athletes, mm. they're just like, yeah, seven. Uh, and then they, they want to move on and check their Facebook. How long does it take? So you implement this as a team during pre-season, which is yep. perfect timing. It's January yep. right now in Australia. You implement the team. How many weeks do you think it takes before that? It will just go seven, seven, seven. Ah. Oh. Six weeks. Six weeks. Uh, it, look, it depends. It, some some teams are going to be more canny because they uh, realise that the coach, that is a way of putting a rev limiter on the coach. If you've got a crazy coach who's like smashing you, uh, they'll know well, that there will be changes made if we if we call it higher. Um, but yeah, I think... Uh, it, in, sorry, um, you remind me of something. In speaking to that though, if athletes are aware of that and they don't tend to like hard work... All of a sudden, everything yeah. becomes a nine in order to get the work yeah. to come down because they're a little bit whingy. Yeah, which tends... I, don't, I guess I don't see that because we're lucky enough to work at the pointy end So, um, and at the lower end, they're not bothering to do it. Having worked at the... Uh, so I was a trainer at um, Sandringham Zebras in the yeah. VFL. It's even at that pointy end. Is it a bit yeah, of that? I think it's because we tend to work with um, female athletes who are a lot more internally driven. So the yeah. WNBA, WNBL athletes and the college mm. athletes, we tend to get like that. Mm. Uh, state basketball... In, in Victoria, is super, super competitive. Mm. So no one wants to be the squeaky one. No one wants to. So we're in a little bit of a hard-working bubble. We're in a hard-working bubble, unfortunately. And the kids... No, that, that's fine. That's great for us. The kids <laughs> we tend to see are also really hard-working. They, they self-select. They, they chase something like the this. kids that don't want to work hard don't come here. Having worked at both uh, the Oakley Chargers and the San Diego Zebras in the, in, bit more of that. In the uh, Australian football... There's kids there who are like, oh, you know, it's just a little bit sore. Yeah. It's just, oh, I think I'll, I think I'll just go one more in the rehab yeah, group. Interesting. Um, so even those groups at that high end, you know, mm. borderline AFL, borderline professional athletes, they'll still find ways and mm. they still get sick of that sort of stuff. So I think we're, I think we're in a bit of a bubble, unfortunately. Mm. Um, I guess the last thing is uh, they're all in. Well, we've talked about internal measures of how people are feeling, and the other the other great trend is um, GPS. Mm-hmm. Where it can actually say, okay, or and GPS plus accelerometers that tell you how far you ran, how much you decelerated, how, how much you accelerated, uh, all that kind of stuff is really, really useful. Yeah, and the really cool metric is um, time spent or total meters at certain velocities. Yes. So, ah, yeah. Nice, nice one. Uh, so, that. Dr. Burgess. Um, Who's now um, a, a new best friend, apparently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a, just so clever. Um, he determined, what he would do is he would pick... A uh, an amount of time that an athlete had spent in zone six, which is the fastest speed, seven meters per second. I think so. I believe. Yep. So it's fast. Um, and then he would he would establish a floor and a ceiling, so you weren't able to you based on your own individual needs and on on what your history of injury. It was okay. You need to be running X amount of meters at X speed every week. And so he would make sure. That, so he floor maintenance. He was maintaining the floor on their load. Really carefully, yeah. so he was mindful of ceiling, being careful not to bust through the ceiling. But he was, at if not more mindful mm-hmm. of not going down through the floor, um, and it was really, really interesting. Which is the whole inspiration and impetus for our holiday program stuff yeah. we do here. Everything we do with the game fits and the repeat sprints. I had a couple athletes this week that broke my heart a little bit. And they said, oh, "I did the strength stuff, but you've got to do the running. You've got to maintain we that." Floor. We made an app. <laughs> we built an app. We've done all these programs. We wrote two hundred and something programs. You've got to do the high speed running. Yeah. That's the whole point. Going for a jog, surfing. No, we had, that's we had one of our guys, here. and I'm not going to name him, um, but he in, he's involved in a sport where sprinting for a very specific distance <laughs> is really important. Maybe timed electronically as well. Yeah, <laughs> and didn't do anything for like we spent we spent six months building him up beautifully. I was ready Nailed to go it. purring, coming along. Yeah, yeah, and didn't do anything for three weeks. Anyway, yeah. despite yeah, yeah. and so. 
Thank you, Dr. Darren Burgess, for that that idea. Yeah. And so we've written a video, we've done or two videos, we've done yeah. an article, filmed a video, yeah. We've built an app all around this concept of maintaining your floor during the holidays, yep. and so it's such an important concept. And it's not just him; it's uh, Dr. Tim Gabbert, uh, Mick Drew from the AS. There's a whole host of people. Um, but I, I really, I really just like the way he implemented it. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is he, so he has a suite. So every session, he's measuring on those suite of metrics, uh, and then he also has what he calls uh, the Burjo number, <laughs> which is where he just rates it based on not having, he rates it blind. Like he just says, oh, I feel like that session was about an eight. Oh, based on watching the athletes do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and he's not a braggy guy at all, but he's like, but I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that, but yeah, mostly yeah. Because it's experience, because you just get a sense of it over time. Um, so that's how you quantify it. Uh, I think the important thing is uh, to try and do something. And even if that something is just uh, have a sense of was like, the most base, base level is, was that session easy, medium, or hard? Like, yeah. You know, like just, that, or it doesn't have you, to be really complicated. Or if your session is variable, how much of it was hard, how yeah. much was medium. So like, I oh, spent probably the last, the, the last quarter of it was really hard, that was the scrimmage bit, or mm. it is. We did some really easy shooting at the start, so probably, you know, half and half. Yeah. And so you got a ballpark of what each session was so that you're, able to vary it up so your athletes yep. don't get stagnant and bored and just sort of going mm. through the, either too easy training or too much hard training so they're getting a mix mm. through their workout so they're getting varied, varied stimulus and then talking to your athletes. Yeah. Um, and, and I suppose the, the other point that's worth sort of discussing is how hard is useful hard and how hard is dangerous and stupid hard. Yeah, that central governor quickly mm. and that uh, CrossFit model. Yeah, <laughs> on the, on the flip so side. So very quickly, the central governor concept is basically your body's system it's set up to preserve its supply of ATP. And so an ATP is the currency of our body in terms of energy. Yeah. And if you run out of ATP, you die. So your body is very, very stingy in terms of it will magnify how hard something feels to guarantee you don't work too hard, therefore... So you can't kill yourself. Yeah. So your muscles can't eat themselves alive, yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, and so, so you don't want to let your central governor be the boss in the sense that it will typically overestimate, like it'll, it'll over fatigue you in terms of how you're feeling. So it'll make you, your perception be higher than... The, the, your the, central governor gives up a little bit before your muscles actually give up. Yeah, you've got, you've got more in the tank than you think you have. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean you just blindly push through. And uh, try and spew every single session you train and collapse on the floor. That's yeah. a terrible idea. Um, and because, I mean, there's, there's a great example of a uh, football, uh, an unqualified football strength and conditioning coach who sent, I think, six of his players to hospital with rhabdomyolysis, so called rhabdo, last year. Was that an American college? Yeah. Oh, yeah, American college football coach. He's having to do like 100 push-ups and 100 squats. Every day and like twice a day and during, yeah. during training. And, and, so, and yeah. so rhabdo, what it is is rhabdo is... Um, your muscles, uh, your muscle cells dying, yep. um, which is not so that you know, you know, uh, pain is weakness leaving your body. Well, in this case, no, it's actually your muscle cells to a degree, dying. pain is weakness. Yeah, yeah. But then, if it goes too far, it's, it's actually muscle cells dying and your kidneys struggling to process them. Yeah, because they, because they've got to get rid of them, and yeah, it's it's not cool. And they had multiple players admitted to hospital. Um, people have had their entire sporting lives cut short by rhabdo by going crazy with it. So to be clear, rhabdo is normally seen in like uh, autoimmune diseases. So yeah. HIV and AIDS, uh, it's seen with like electrocutions, burn things, crush injuries, when your muscles yeah. like literally crushed to death and then you release and the so crush, all that creeds and kinase, which is an inflammatory so, so interesting. Yeah. Uh, waste product, if you will, floods the body, the body can't handle it, you get kidney overload and you get renal failure. Yeah, which is people full on. die, yeah. <laughs> serious stuff. Um, and it's a proper, it was a proper problem in CrossFit. Mm. People would just train these, because there's that, peer pressure to push really hard, which again, in the right hands is really good. Um, but that was quite a pro I think, I feel like they've got it more under control last now. last 24 months, I reckon it's been better, but when we first heard about this, it's like, it's like whoa, what are you guys doing? I think they call it Uncle Rabdo or Rabdo Uncle, the Clown. Pu Pukey the Clown. Pukey the Clown and Uncle Rabdo, I think it was. Yeah, like, uh, like jokey stuff. Because it's a joke, I've got this <laughs> potentially fatal <laughs> renal disease. Uh, and you have to, and I, I've seen, I've personally seen, uh, what are the sheets though? A waiver. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, do you promise not to sue us if you get, you, you, you've been signing this document, you're aware that rhabdomyolysis is, is a risk of training too hard. Do you uh, promise yeah. not to sue us if you get rhabdo from training with us? Basically, if you hurt yourself or if yeah. you develop this serious condition yeah. uh, and your kidney's found and you die, 
Not our fault. <laughs> You're the one who pushed yourself. Um, yeah, so you want to push hard and you probably, and you want to push harder than you think you should in the vast majority of cases. Um, but, and you want to do it in, in intervals where you can work hard then rest, because that kind of gets around the central governor. That's why eight and 12s are so good, because eight seconds, it's so short, your central governor doesn't even get yeah. a chance to realize what's going on. Eight and 12, 70s, like when, you, when you're running, like yep. you, 70 meter efforts. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, you want to do ways that you can have a bit of rest and then go and then actually get that intensity. Um, closing thoughts, uh, use our app. Please, please download and use our app, <laughs> athletes. <laughs> it's free. Um, and just look for an undulation of intensity across your week. Don't be at 10 out of 10 every session. Yeah. Uh, don't be at zero out of 10, mix it up. More of your work should be intense than less, um, but there should be an undulation within it. Still should be the occasional easing session, some rolling and stretching, yeah. walking the dog, stuff like that in there as well. Yeah. For sure. Mm. Uh, as far as show notes go, I will link to Darren Burgess. I'll try yeah. and find his, uh, his meters per second paper as well. Yeah, that's okay. a really cool one. Yeah. Uh, I'll link to our two articles yep. about, uh, our two videos, sorry, about acute to chronic workload ratio. Yeah, great. And uh, we've got an article on that as well. Yeah. I'll link to all that awesome. stuff. Okay. Enjoy, people. Nice.